we're leaving European Union. How far will that develop if the negotiations on our leaving the European Union get more difficult, more fracturous, and perhaps more antagonistic? Um, and in particular, how does all this impact on the future relationship between uh, Britain and Spain, not so much at governmental level, but in culture, in the arts, in sport, in design, in fashion, uh, in all of these areas in which we've come to co uh, cooperate uh, particularly closely in the past. Is that cooperation now in jeopardy? And if so, what can we do to avoid it? And finally, what about people? What about people? How far do the views of governments and the views that we might have of another country or another country have of us in Britain, how much do those reflect on people's day-to-day -day inter interactions? all of those Spaniards living here in the UK, all the British people living in Spain. Uh, how much will, that, will those relationships be changed by the fact that we are leaving the, Europe, uh, the European Union? Will they be changed for the better or for the worse? Now, lots of questions and I have no answers at all. So, uh, we do have assembled by the British Spanish Society a distinguished uh, panel of experts under the chairmanship of our chairman, uh, Jimmy Burns, uh, chairman of the British Spanish Society, so I shall pass straight over to Jimmy to take over this and, uh, 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 and to lead the debate. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, thank you very much, Charles. Um, for those of you who, who don't know me, I, I'm, I'm Jimmy Burns um, from Marañón. Uh, I'm, I'm an Anglo-Spaniard, uh, born in Madrid, British father, Spanish mother, um, journalist and author by trade. Um, and I'm also chairman of the British Spanish Society, which I'm, I'm uh, very proud of, of the organization and the wonderful people, volunteers that uh, I work with. And I wanted to just sort of begin by, by paying thanks, first of all, to Canning House. Uh, we're a great partnership, again, um, between these two great institutions. Um, particularly, it's good to see Ro, a couple of Ro here, the CEO. And uh, Gillian Graham has been very helpful, and Jeremy Evans. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Ignacio Peiro of the Cervantes Institute, who has obviously uh, also promoted this event, um, and um, particularly uh, Cuatro Casas for sponsoring this, and uh, our team at the British Spanish Society, which uh, Maria Soriano, Jordi, Mateo, and Arroyo Cepero have been absolute stars as always. It's taken a lot of work to organise this, and the product of of their work is, is all you lot turning up and it's, it's uh, lleno hasta la bandera and there's still people trying to get in. So that, that's great. Um, and I wanted obviously to thank all of you for coming here. Muchísimas gracias a todos and, and uh, bienvenidos. Um, I just really wanted just to say a, little, a, a few words um, because it's relevant to the discussion. Um, the British Spanish Society is 100 years old. We were uh, founded in, in uh, 1916 in the middle of a terrible... Uh, world War, huge bloodshed, lots of young people being killed. Um, and it was put together by a very small group of Spaniards and British who extended a, a hand of friendship. And uh, it was it happened to be the one of the centenaries of Cervantes and, uh, uh, and, and um, Shakespeare. And obviously it was a sort of um, wonderful opportunity to remind people with these two great global cultural icons with the two languages, um, how important it was to try and see different ways of engagement to simply killing each other. Um, and um, I can say that we, we completely, because you know, you'll see that from the history book that we've got on sale out there, that we've, we've been through all the peaks and troughs of crises, change, changes of government, both here and in Spain, um, and, and nothing quite fa phases us, really. Um, we've survived the Spanish Civil War, we survived Franquismo, transition to democracy, and we're still here and fighting and growing. Our membership has tripled over the last six years, and, and we're proud of it. Um, I also simply wanted to, to point out, because this will be relevant to um, one, one of the themes that we'll talk about, um, one of the things we do as a charity is we support a scholarship programme for British and Spanish postgraduate students, and, and that's really, really important, uh, particularly in the challenging times that we face today. Um, and, you know, our becarios are not only exemplars of their craft, from everything from sciences to the humanities, 
but they're reinvesting in the future of society and, and keeping going uh, faith in this uh, cultural, scientific, academic relationship between the two countries. Um, Giles has very well already gone through the, um, you know, why we're doing it, the success of our In the Mirror conference last year. This is a follow-up to that. Um, and I think, uh, you know, the, the sort of, tonight has been deliberately framed, uh, quite broadly framed, um, uh, with the intention of, of, of drawing out, uh, not quite a journey without maps, but drawing out from the panel and from the questions we're going to get from, from the audience probably unexpected uh, things as well as expected things but also different perspectives all the people you see there and I'll introduce them in a minute come from different backgrounds different perspectives and they can shed probably light on things in a way uh, you'll probably find surprising um, the visit of the king and queen of Spain earlier this summer uh, I think most of in fact everyone in this in this room would agree was 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 a huge success and also a reminder of um, the, the strength, uh, the enduring strength of bilateral relations. Um, uh, but, you know, I don't have to, to, to tell you that Brexit um, is an issue that has probably divided the British people more than any other issue since Suez, um, has already strained our relations with Europe to an unprecedented degree. Um, London's new inward investor, former New York Mayor Michael Bloomberg, only earlier this week, said that Brexit was the stupidest thing any country has done until America trumped it. <laughs> By contrast, the Eton-educated uh, Tory MP for North East Somerset, uh, familiar to some of you, um, the Eton-educated um, campaigning and leading Brexiteer, uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg, describes Brexit as a, quote, wonderful liberation for this country. Uh, unquote, and then quote again, there is no political event in my lifetime that has been better or more exciting for this nation of ours. Evidently, there are issues of national identity, issues of sovereignty, the whole question of, you know, is an elect an, a new electorate out there that feels itself unrepresented by... Um, by the status quo, and I don't just mean national governments, I'm obviously referring there to the bureaucracy in Europe, uh, in Brussels. Um, and the whole issue which Giles uh, was referring to, of, of um, to what extent can and will uh, the UK and Spanish bilateral relationship survive and be able to fit into the idea of a future European compact, um, which might look pretty different to what we're seeing today. Um, uh, and this throws up quite a lot to talk about in not very lot of time, and I won't hold, hold you much longer, uh, not least in these days of uh, challenges of independence or for independence, from Glasgow to Girona, uh, and you know what I'm referring to. Um, before I introduce the panel, um, I just wanted to make a, a, a few, I hate the word um, housekeeping rules, but I mean, this is just so you've got an idea how, how we're going to do this. Um, I plan to end uh, pretty sharply at quarter to eight, uh, at which point we can go to reception. Some of you I know have to leave early, catch trains uh, and, and leave for, for other things. Um, we are going to have questions, obviously, from the audience. Uh, some of them have already been submitted and I will uh, draw them up. Those questions uh, will have to come through the chair, and I will address them to the, um, uh, to the panel. So that will be a kind of BBC-style um, uh, question time format. Um, maybe your brother Jeremy should be here instead of me. Um, I mean, all I ask, obviously, are that the questions are relevant, short, please. You know, no ramblings uh, and, and no kind of speeches. Um, and um, I will be calling on the panellists uh, at the start to make a kind of opening pitch of not more than four, four minutes, uh, five minutes max. Um, and I don't know what they're going to say or where they're going to come from, and it's probably quite a tough act for them to start off with, but that's what they're going to begin with, and then we'll start uh, throwing questions at them. Um, so it is, without further ado, a great pleasure uh, for me to introduce... 
uh, this very illustrated uh, illustro um, panel. Um, you might notice that one person who's not here is Raphael Minder, and my colleague Raphael Minder. Um, and, you know, as I think we've alerted some of you, as you could probably expect, uh, you know, the New York Times uh, bureau guy in, uh, in Spain uh, is being slightly caught up with developments in Catalonia, uh, which are ongoing as we speak. Uh, he had his flight booked already. Uh, he was literally on the way to the airport, and um, he's had to turn back. Um, but I'm absolutely delighted to have my other colleague here, Miles Johnson, uh, second from the left, um, from the FT, um, who knows more about uh, most of these subjects probably than even Raphael does. Um, he's the FT's capital markets editor, based in London, covering international finance. Uh, having joined the FT as a graduate trainee makes me feel very old, actually. Uh, he has worked on the papers as the paper's Spanish correspondent during the European debt crisis, uh, returning to London to cover hedge funds, and later being appointed investment editor before his current role. Um, he has won several awards for his work and has featured on British and Spanish television and radio. Um, right at the end... Um, my good friend Chris Bain, um, a British Labour Party politician who's been Member of Parliament between 2001 and 2016. Um, in 2009, he was Parliamentary Under Secretary of State, Minister for Europe in the Foreign Commonwealth Office. Uh, Chris was then appointed Shadow Home Office Minister with a responsibility for immigration, followed by a period as the Shadow D DWP Minister. He was later uh, promoted to the Shadow Cabinet as Shadow Minister for Culture, Media and Sport and subsequently became Shadow Leader of the House of Lords. Uh, he resigned from the Shadow Cabinet... Sorry, House of Commons. <laughs> what a Freudian slip. Um, he resigned from the Shadow Cabinet in June 2016 um, he currently, correct me if I'm wrong, I hope I don't put my foot in again, you are on the Extremely Influential Foreign Affairs Committee, as from September. Um, Estrella Luna, um, I'm, I'm delighted you're here. She's come all the way from Sheffield. Um, she is the current new president of SUC, which is the Society for Researchers and Investigators, Spanish researchers and investigators and scientists in the UK, a grouping of all the kind of uh, the great and the good of young uh, investigators and researchers uh, it's Spanish in, in the UK across all the universities. Um, she graduated as a technical agricultural engineer from the University Jaume I Castellón in 2006. Uh, she spent a few months traveling before she moved to Valencia. In December 2008, she completed a hard engineering degree in agronomy. In January 2009, she was awarded the Leonardo da Vinci Training Fellowship to work at Rothamsted Research in Harpenden, UK. Um, just to fast forward a bit, Estrella has completed her PhD in Biological uh, scientists, so Sciences. Uh, she is currently, as I say, in Sheffield University. Uh, she has completed her PhD and worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the Department of Animal and plant sciences, science sciences at the University of Sheffield and has been there for three years. She is married to an Englishman. Uh, all right, her partner is an Englishman and, uh, and has lived here for 11 years. Yeah? Nine or 11 years. Um, Fernando. Uh, Fernando Minguez, I'm delighted. He's flown in all the way from Madrid, especially for this. Um, uh, really honoured to have you here, as I am indeed with all the other panels. A former official of the Bank of Spain's supervision department, Fernando is a renowned expert in all areas of banking and finance, particularly Spanish and international regulation of credit institutions. Uh, recommended by several directories, including Legal 500 and Best Lawyers in Banking and Finance and Corporate and M&A, he coordinates his firm Cuatro Casas Financial Services Practice in Madrid. Um, he also critically coordinates the firm's Brexit focus group. Um, last but by no means least is John. John Carlin, um, probably one of my uh, colleagues and not only colleagues but heroes. Um, we've been shadowing each other for the past more than uh, 30 years of our professional life, starting in Buenos Aires, 
and now Vard Sitches and ending up here. Um, he do doesn't really need much introduction to most of you, but he is probably uh, one of the best known international reporters. Um, he has reported from over 50 countries. He's written for the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, the FT, the Times, the Observer. He's bilingual, Anglo-Spanish like I am, um, and uh, has been reporting frequently on world affairs for El País. Um, Not anymore. Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> uh, he's also uh, a, a, a well-known author. Uh, he wrote uh, a, a superb um, uh, book about uh, about rugby and and a part the end of apartheid and Nelson Mandela playing the enemy Nelson Mandela and the game that made a nation. Uh, he's also biographer Rafa Nadal. Uh, he has won British Press Awards, um, and he's an altogether pretty nice guy actually. And he's also uh, pretty crazy about football as I am. Um, so that's a pretty long introduction, but I think they deserve um, a good round of applause for being with us. So I think um, I will begin by asking Chris uh, to kick off. And can I just remind you, panelists, that you've got a sort of maximum of four and a half minutes. It's, it's changed. It was five and then four and now four and a half. Right. Um, well, uh, I'm Chris Bryant, by the way, not Bain. I seem to not Chris Bryant, sorry. I'm a member of the House of Lords. Um, I, I'm really struck, or I have been struck over the last few months, how um, many similarities there are in the uh, political situation in our two countries. Um, in both countries, you have a uh, centre-right <coughs> conservative government, which hasn't got a majority, um, has had repeated elections and still hasn't got um, a majority, uh, and uh, struggled and has struggled in many ways to form a government and to find permanent. Um, Whoever speaks. The, um, we've uh, we, we've um, also had on the left in both countries, um, although in 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 are we meant to be right, <laughs> right. Um, uh, also on the left in both countries, uh, although in Spain Podemos and PSOE are obviously separate parties. Um, in the in the UK, there are basically two parties within the Labour Party at the moment. Um, so a very similar situation and. and and in fact, I would say that it's only because we don't have PR in this country um, and we have first-past-the-post system that nobody's talking about splitting up um, those two parties in the Labour Party or, for that matter, in the Conservative Party. Um, so you've got some fairly similar situations. You've also got um, a bid for independence by a significant part of each of the two countries. Uh, you have um, an asymmetrical devolution in, in the two countries. And uh, so far as I can see now, um, more people eat chorizo in this country than do in Spain. Um, uh, though I, I, it really irritates me that even Marks and Spencer still refers to it in its ad as ch ads as chorizo. Um, and I don't know how we're going to get round this, because every time I say, no, it's chorizo, I, I, people look at me as if I'm being an utter snob. Um, and, uh, well, not for the first time. Um, but then there are things that sh are sharply divide us. I was the, the most striking thing for me over the last few months was seeing the Spanish king speaking into a political situation on television. I cannot conceive of the queen in this country <coughs> going on television to intervene in the debate about Scottish independence. Um, you also, of course, have a written constitution in Spain, and we have no such thing in the UK, and indeed in the UK... The government can rewrite every single element of the constitution, whatever it, uh, the unwritten bits of it, it can rewrite them, if you see what I mean, um, all the time, such as deciding that it's going to give itself a majority on all committees in the House of Commons and things like that, because the sta none, neither the standing orders nor when Parliament sits or anything like that is decided by anybody other than the government. So we have a completely winner-takes-all system in the UK, but in Spain you have a written constitution um, which has to be adhered to. Um, and, um, and yet, we face some of the same pulls. I think that uh, one of the most difficult elements um, for all politicians anywhere in the world at the moment is um, social media has created for the vast majority of people an echo chamber um, where people listen to the kind of people that they agree with and consequently feel their views are magnified and they start to feel them more strongly and more strongly and more strongly. 
Um, and that, I think, is one of the th things that has driven the, the, the quite a significant level of anger that infects politics in both countries. Um, I, I was struck in um, the difference between newspaper bro um, reporting of what's been happening in Catalonia and broadcasting reporting in Spain, where I have yet to see any um, broadcast news from Spain by Spanish broadcasters, which it could in any sense be considered unbiased. Every single piece I've watched has been utterly biased in one direction or another. I personally think that the BBC has been rather taken in by the Catalan argument rather too easily. Um, I've, I've felt very critical, and I think that's because a lot of people in this country still buy... Um, they, they think too readily of Franco and fascism, um, and they think too readily that the Catalan situation is the same as the Spanish situation. I, as a socialist, passionately um, want Spain to stay together for a very simple reason. You've gone on to about six minutes. I haven't, because I started at 25 past, and it's not half past yet, according to the clock up there. Um, but I will end on that then, all right? Um. Four minutes. Um, I'm conscious that, that you know, as I said at the beginning, we're, we're, we're in a map without, um, uh, with a sort of uh, a journey without maps, but um, I'm also conscious I don't want to get too early in the debate diverted into Catalonia. But we're here to talk about Brexit and we will get to Catalonia, but I don't think that there's. Oh, I see, so I was shut up. Um, nice. <laughs> um, but on that point, can I bring in. Um, Fernando, uh, now, uh, and, and if you can sort of make your whatever you have to say about how you see the Brexit issue. Uh, so, back on Brexit then. Um, you first, thank you very much for having me here, Jimmy, and um, um, uh, perhaps a, 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 I should start by a couple of words on, on, on why, why a, a Spanish law firm uh, takes particular attention on, on Brexit. Further than, of course, uh, um, as, as, as interested observers of reality. Well, uh, the answer is that we uh, look at this in, um, say in a technical fashion. So it's the, from, uh, if you allow me the comparison, it's like, um, like if you were a doctor and, and you suddenly uh, um, hear that in, 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 in a hospital elsewhere uh, someone has discovered a very rare disease. So you, you are terribly interested in that uh, for, for pure, pure, purely professional reasons, right? There are also, you know, business-related reasons. Of course, Brexit is a process that's likely to have an impact, um, very wide impact, uh, very broad in, 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 in different aspects of, the, um, of British life, by extension of the relationship between British, Britain and Spain, and eventually will, will impact our, our everyday lives, right? This has not yet happened, or not yet happened to a, a remarkable extent, right? But of course we have to monitor the events. So, um, the, 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 the reason why we're taking a pr primarily interest in this is, is, is technical. We, we, we are, we are um, you know, this is, this is widely unprecedented. It's, it's, it's well, totally unprecedented. So there's no, there's no, there's been no prior example of any country leaving the European Union and departing or, or, or forming or you know becoming the first departure in in, in the process that uh, was perceived to be in in, in constant progress. So the, this 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 was so far perceived to be a unidirectional process, right? Always ahead. Well, we've we've suddenly learned that it is not necessarily so, and, and, and it's good to keep that in mind. Um, <coughs> but the first lesson we have to, to, to draw, um, uh, you know, Chris was m making reference to, uh, to our similarities. Um, Brexit, you know, puts us before one of our most remarkable differences, which is the attitude towards, towards the European process, the European integration process. And, and, and towards Europe, generally speaking. Um, for, from a Spanish perspective, from, for the average Spaniard, this is totally an understandable. 
And it's totally an understandable because from a Spanish mentality, it's difficult to conceive that consciously um, 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 a country may be unwilling to take part in the European integration process. Right. You, you, you can't find Spaniards of, you know, literally every mind. You, you can't find even a lot of Spaniards who don't want to be Spaniards. But uh, even those Spaniards who don't want to be Spaniards by no means want to cease being Europeans. Right? It's, it's so strange to find a Spaniard who does not want to be European, right, that it's kind of inconceivable to us that the, 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 the widespread mentality, or it, the, it may be widespread in the mentality of another country, uh, or well, simply that in, in other countries, not only the UK, probably the same happens to a different extent in other members of the European Union. It may, be not, it may not be so in, 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 uh, in, in other places. But that's, that's, that's what it is. It's, it's a, the first lesson we have to draw if, if, if we, um, if we you know, intend to minimally understand what's going on is that simply British attitude toward the, to, towards Europe and European integration is entirely different because of historical reasons, because of social slash psychological reasons before because of a wide variety of reasons. So this, is, this was my, 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 my first idea, and uh, so be, be patient with your Spanish counterparts or, or your Spanish friends, because they simply don't understand. It's, it's, very, it's very complex for us to, to interiorize this and to, and to put ourselves in, in your shoes and, and see the process uh, more or less uh, like, like, like the British do, right? Second, second question, going back to the, this was a more, <coughs> say, cultural political point, going back to technicalities um, or, or technical issues, right? Unfortunately, your know, experts are back, right? Okay, you've decided you want to, you want to be out, you want to leave the European Union. Um, in, in deciding so, it was said that you were fed up with experts. <laughs> now experts have to say the decision and have to make it true. They, they, they have to deliver, right? They have to deliver on the decision. And this is probably, um, this, is, this is really demanding, right? So you, you, the, the, the British people have decided it was time to leave. Now how do you leave the European Union? How do you actually leave? Okay, and drawing parallels. So you want to be independent. So how do you become independent tomorrow? What's, what's, you know, you, I want to be independent, that's a feeling. I want to leave the European Union, that's a feeling. That's a, a political feeling, it's a political decision. Now, how, how do I turn this into practice? Right? How, how, do I, how, do, how do I make this real? I think this is the debate, this is currently, it's not, not so much a debate, it's, 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 it's really the difficult task the, the, the UK administration is, is, is now going through. And, uh, they're still well in 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 the <coughs> continent we are still wondering whether this is this will be possible at all uh, whether this the, the 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 country will have to you know step back and 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 you know revert the decision simply because it's not doable just please don't don't take this as a as a uh, as a sign of disrespect but you know uh, very often when i think of Brexit, you know, comes to my mind that that famous film, The Life of Brian. Do you remember? <coughs> you remember in one of the gatherings? I, I, I can't remember whether the, the the Judaic Popular Front of the Popular Front of Judea they were <coughs> they were you know absolutely in agreement that they they were fed up with the Romans. They, they 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 couldn't stand the Romans anymore. So and at some point in one of the discussions, they some the, the, one of the leaders asked, well, what, "What have the Romans done for us?" There's a big of silence in the room, and someone you know, raises their hand and said, so, the, the watering, what do you mean by the watering? Mm -hmm. Yes, we have running water because Roman here. Okay, apart from the watering, what, what apart from the watering? The roads. We have the roads because the Romans are here. <coughs> and, and you can, you know, you, you can go out at night safely, etc., etc., etc. So, six, seven, six reasons, right? Okay, but in the end, what? In the end, nothing, nothing. Of course, nothing, right? 
the European Union is pretty much like the Romans, right? We, we, we are fed up with the European Union, but when we, we, we ha we're going to get rid of the European Union, and we act when, when we actually make ourselves the question, what the hell do, they, do these people do for us, apart from, you know, um, um, getting uh, out a significant part of our taxes, etc., etc., etc. The truth is that the European Union permeates the life of the different member <laughs> countries to an extent which is normally not, not inconceivable, simply not visible to the vast majority of the population. It's like the Romans thing. You walk on the road and, and you easily lose sight that there's, there's a road because the Romans are there. You don't care about the Romans, but if not for the Romans, there would be no road. So the argument can be taken to a... It, it's applicable to a great extent, right? Planes fly because there is a European Union, you know? Uh, drugs are tested fairly quickly because there is a European Union. So you have to replace all that. And, and, and we, could go, we could go on and on and on. Uh, I call the process interesting, uh, um, terribly interesting, uh, but probably interesting is not, um, it's, it's a technical word to describe it. So I leave it here, sorry. Okay. Um, just before I introduce the, the next, I mean, we'll bring in the next panelist. Um, there are a, a couple of seats here, Ron, stand and flake out. Um, there's a seat here, there's two seats here. Can, can you sort of occupy them? Um, just to keep going, um, I think um, I'd like to bring in um, Carlin. Carlin, okay. Um, well, I, I've been living in, in London for the last four years, but for the previous 15 years I was living in, in Barcelona, and, um, but even though I'm in London, I go back to Barcelona and Madrid approximately once every three weeks, so I'm quite in touch with how people view Brexit over there. And until um, the rather more pressing matters of domestic concern emerged in the last month or two, people talked a lot about Brexit. And the prevailing view that I found is a sense of how spectacularly unnecessary this whole Brexit business is. And just what an incredible mess and series of unnecessary complications it's caused um, this country. I think most people in Spain who follow Brexit with some degree of interest are aware of the fact that the Brexit referendum was not called because of a popular clamour in the way that it was in Scotland or such a hypothetical referendum might be called in, in Catalonia. It obeyed, um, it was in response to David Cameron's attempt to solve internal problems in the Conservative Party, which of course we find today remain quite as vivid and sharp, I'm talking the divisions in the party, as ever. Um, every time that you see poor old Theresa May getting into a tangle or David Davis or, or in fact, you know, for that matter, the, the Labour Party sort of fudging it, sitting in the middle, Jeremy Corbyn pretending to the youth at Glastonbury that he's in favour of Europe, but actually he's not, and all this... And, you know, as, as you were saying, I mean, just, it's just the whole thing just seems so utterly undoable. And, and in the very best of cases, it's going to be an exercise in damage control. And so, yes, people in Spain find it all rather baffling. Um, and I think, again, if you, if you sit down and have a proper conversation with people in Spain about this, they'll probably start to speculate that it's got to do with British peoples and perhaps in particular English peoples' failure to reconcile themselves to the loss of empire. I don't believe that. Um, I don't believe that the real logic or the, or, or the, the chief impulse beyond being in favour of Brexit is you know, a cold assessment of the economic facts. Um, I think that in all in all cases, everybody in this room, we take our political positions. They just emerge through our lives, from our parents, from our friends, from our environment, um, in a way the team we're on picks us. And then once we're on that team, we then start selecting and cherry-picking our arguments and facts that we like in order to, to support our team. And that's what people are doing who you know, are in favour of Brexit and, and they give you, I don't know, 350 million quid on the NHS and all the rest of it. But 
you know, I, th I think the thing goes deeper. It's a much more emotional, historical, psychological thing. And I tend to agree with a lot of people in Spain who say, yeah, obviously it's to do with these guys have failed to reconcile themselves with the loss of empire. And so Giles was talking before about, you know, these notions of uh, we're going to go beyond the EU global trading. I remember, I think it was a day or two after the Brexit referendum, um, there was some senior government representative in Hong Kong gave a speech in which he welcomed the fact that Britain, that his perception that Britain was now going to return to, quote, an Elizabethan golden age. I mean, it pretty much, you know, said it all right there. And, and, and in the case of Jacob Rees-Mogg, you mentioned, you know, he's someone who's clearly sort of trapped in 1851. And so you, you can see how he sort of emotionally wants to go back to this, to this you know, magnificent global trading nation, um, which, of course, is complete fairy tales, the notion that... that you, that New Zealand or Singapore or Borneo or whatever is going to compensate for the loss of potential, potential loss of business with, um, with Europe. Um, I'll just make a slight aside. I'll stop talking in a second, but just very, very briefly, on, in terms of what's going on in Spain right now, it just occurred to me now that actually the spectacularly unnecessary mess in which Spain finds itself now over Catalonia, uh, just as spectacularly unnecessary as, as Brexit, if not more so, I think also has to do with a failure of Spain and certainly certain people who govern things in Madrid also to reconcile themselves to loss of empire. On that tantalizing note, I'll just stop talking. Um, I think it's, three, uh, it's your turn now. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm delighted to be here. I was wondering what I could contribute with no, to this debate, uh, especially with this impressive panel. Uh, but I would like to bring into the picture the science, the academia, the scientific excellence and knowledge, and how Brexit can affect all this. Mm. So as Jimmy has said, I, I moved to the UK nine years ago, and initially I was going to be here only for six months. And, but then I decided to do my PhD here, and then I was planning on coming back, but it was the crisis in Spain, there were no jobs, everyone was leaving basically on this brain drain. So I decided to stay as a postdoc. And it's here when I actually uh, got to know the, Spanish, uh, the Society of Spanish Researchers in the UK, which is a society that I chair at the moment. And, uh, I also had my son. I am not married, but I think I've led Jimmy to think I am because I call my partner my husband because we have been together for too long now, I think. <laughs> um, so, so I have different perspective. I can talk about Brexit and what Brexit uh, can uh, impact my life in, from a personal point of view because I have a British family. My partner is British. My son is British. My family-in-law are all British. Some of them have, uh, they voted for Brexit, for example, and we have had different heated discussions of why they voted for Brexit and um, things like this. Um, but also from a professional point of view, because I work in a university in the north. I work at the University of Sheffield. And I think something very important is to realize in the di about the difference between the south and the north of the UK. I think that um, whereas some universities here in the south, in London, in Cambridge, or in Oxford, are not feeling the Brexit push that much, I think the universities in the north of England and, and Scotland are definitely, they have kind of pressed a panic mode button, you know, and, and they are behaving differently. There are a lot of changes, there, are, there is lack of funding, there is a pause in the strategic developments, and, and overall instability okay, in our lives. So I can also bring that point, that, that difference between the south and the north of the UK. But also I can talk about uh, what us as a society uh, from SRUK, what means Brexit. And we ran a survey uh, uh, last year, actually, is when we had it, but we published it in March, just when Brexit was triggered. And we wanted to ask our members, we wanted to find out what Brexit meant at that time, okay, when there is basically, there was, well, make, Brexit means Brexit, but that doesn't mean anything to us. So what was the impact of Brexit in our members? And we, we got some scary numbers, in a way, because 30% of our membership 
had changed their plans only because of the result of the EU referendum. So they were planning to move, to go somewhere else. 30% for me is a really big number. Um, and also more scary is that 43% of them are waiting, or at least last year they were waiting for the agreements to develop. How is the situation going to unravel in the end? And one of the things that we could see out of this um, survey was uncertainty. Everyone was like, it will depend. Everyone was answering, it will depend. It, if this happens, if that happens. And at the present time, we are preparing again that survey. We want to run it again as a monitoring. We want to know what these 43% are thinking, are they still waiting? They gave up and left? Uh, we, we just don't know what's, what's happening. But the most thing that you could see was this uncertainty. Uncertainty to what is going to happen, what will Brexit bring to the scientific uh, system in the UK. And my concern now, as a chair of the society and also from a personal point of view, is that we don't have a path still. Those concerns are still uh, valid. Basically, we, from from my view, we haven't really walked towards Brexit. We are still in the game of wait and see, and and that's something that I think is really damaging more than moving towards somewhere that can give some clarity. Yeah. That's very very interesting. Um, I just want to be just if I go to Miles, you just clarify that. Um, I mean, from your, your experience, I mean, since the Brexit vote, um, how, how many of your colleagues have actually said, this is it, they don't love us here? Um, when, you know, either that or funding have, have quit projects. Well, we don't have exact numbers. We have some case studies of people that have left, that have decided to move on, to go to other parts. Um, but definitely 30% of the people that responded to the survey said, yeah, my plans have changed for several reasons, for the lack of funding, for personal reasons, you know, I need to guarantee the rights of my family that live here, things like that. So 30% were expected to, to, to leave. Miles, you live in Royal Splendor in, uh, at the FT. Um, how, how does um, your experience uh, and the things that we've been talking about on the table so far um, come, come at it from your angle? Okay, I mean, I'd like to, I'm sure some of the audience or maybe lots of the audience are aware that Richard Thaler uh, won the Nobel Prize for Economics uh, this year for basically the insight, which was radical in economics at the time, but sometimes people do stupid things. They don't <laughs> act rationally. So I think that the problem with lots of debates on Brexit um, is that they often suppose that maybe this was a rational choice, this was a rational decision, people were calculating all of the likely outcomes. And I think that's sort of the first thing I, I would like to say. I think from my perspective um, of living in Spain as a foreign correspondent, I think, you know, uh, certain things which John has already mentioned, there are things where we have to think about how both Britain and Spain see themselves and also how Britain and Spain see the European Union. And I think... <laughs> In regards to how Spain sees itself, something that really struck me when I first moved to Spain was a certain sort of lack of confidence amongst lots of um, Spaniards I met, lots of my friends. There's a lot of self-criticism. There are lots of people who always say, oh, this country's so crap. Like, oh, the politicians are so terrible. Oh, my God, you know, all of these terrible things. And it always surprised me um, because I actually thought, you know, there were some problems, but it wasn't really that bad in many cases. And it was actually quite similar to lots of other countries and other places. And secondly, the other thing which really struck me when I was living there was that the um, something which I found very strange at first was the obsession with the Spanish media of what other international media were writing about them. So basically when some sort of, you know, minor rag like the FT would write a sort of editorial or something about Spain, this would sometimes even lead the evening news during a point in the crisis, which was something which was absolutely inconceivable in the UK. The idea that the BBC would go, yes, like El País has written like this piece on the UK saying they're all a bunch of clowns and they don't know what they're doing about Brexit, that would just never happen. And so, and this happened regularly, you know, when The Economist did their cover with, um, I think it was a, a bull falling off, falling out, uh, the bull falling off the flag or something like that. Anyway, this was, this was always a big deal. So that was something which I'm struck 
strikes me that the, this sort of obsession with what the international community thought about them compared to in the UK where there is basically a complete blind spot to what the, the rest of the world um, sees us as. And so then it comes to the European Union and the European Union, you know, in the history of Spain, as has been mentioned by my fellow panelists, you know, the European Union is a redemptive you know, force. It's something which has basically taken Spain from, you know, a sort of international prior status into back into the sort of fold of respectable nations. Whereas for certain types of Brexiteers, the sort of Jacob Rees Moggs of this world, the EU is a symbol of British decline. It's something which has basically taken Britain from being this country that stands above and aside from the rest to being this sort of, you know, just little island off the side of Europe, um, which um, is very, very painful. So, you know, um, as John has mentioned, there's sort of like this, the final paroxysms, the death, like, you know, thrills of a, of, a, of, a, of a colonial decline, where for certain types of the British elites at this point, people who grew up in the 50s, the 60s, you know, after the large, large part of, um, you know, after the empire, there was still a sort of underlying assumption, this confidence in, um, in you know, self-confidence in um, the way Britain saw and British people saw themselves in the world. And I think in the Spanish colonial experience, you know, the sort of um, humiliation, you know, which Britain experienced at Suez happened far earlier. And there's been far longer to sort of gestate this um, lack of, you know, this loss of status. Um, and um, the other thing is the, the Spanish perception of Britons, which I think I'll finish on, which is that Spanish, uh, the, there was always, um, but there was always something where there was a sense that the British people were quite serious, professional. There was an idea that, you know, that Britain was like a stable country that should be sort of respected. Um, and um, I think, you know, in terms of the sort of inverse of that stereotype is that I think, you know, Spain is seen as sort of this fun, kind of, you know, you know, hot country, you know, and it, 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 these are very crude stereotypes, but this is sort of a relationship which will maybe start to invert somewhat, you know, in terms of the, uh, the sort of, um, you know, post Brexit, I think, you know, with this, um, uh, there will be a long gradual period of very painful readjustment of self image for the UK. And I think that, um, you know, what this will take a while to sink in. But um, over time, the assumption, the stride, which sort of um, the sort of uh, British Brexiteer has when they walk around the world and think, you know, see, you know, the, the future of um, this great British trading empire, I think it will be this period of adjustment. And I think in regards to how Spain sees Britain, I think now uh, the serious idea the, the, the you know, the British people who get stuff done has probably um, been severely dented, I would say. And I think with that, I will finish. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think that leads me seriously into what I would call the kind of um, parliamentary part of this, which is we, we've solicited questions from, from our members, and um, I'm going to try and be as fair as possible. Uh, we're going to try and get through some of them, uh, and then I might uh, just give the opportunity to those who didn't submit questions to maybe come up with something more, more, more spontaneous. Um, these are all going to be, those of you familiar with the cricket terms, a sort of a bit of a googly because they're going to come from all sorts of directions. Um, and uh, as I've said uh, to all of you, um, the panellists are, are quite free uh, to simply say, I'm not qualified to answer, or I don't feel like answering this question. Uh, but I would probably know the kind of people who run this panel who would be more than willing to answer. So um, I'm sure we'll get quite interesting views. Um, the first from Graham Brock is um, Spanish people seem to be, and this goes very, follows on from what Miles was just suggesting. Um, the question Spanish people seem to be aware of two broad types of Britishmen. Let's call them the gentleman and the hooligan. Does the panel believe that the direction Brexit is taking the UK favours the gentleman or the hooligan? John Carlin. <laughs> Why me? Why do I have to handle it? Um, yeah, I guess that um, you know, given that the perception, as I think you know, we all seem to agree on this table <coughs> in Spain, is that um, Brexit was um, one of these stupid acts that the, the Nobel Prize-winning economist talks about. Um, the FT calls it an act of self-harm. I think it's a habitual phrase I use that. Then um, I guess that if yeah, I think I think it's right to say that the perception of Spanish people, of of the Brits is of the English in particular, 
is, um, you know, oscillates between gentleman and hooligan, uh, with not much sort of shading in between. And, um, and I would say that as a consequence of Brexit, the pendulum has definitely swung somewhat more towards the perception, you know, of English people as hooligans. Uh, Chris, would you like to comment on this? Uh, I can't tell really what, um, whether that's accurate. I mean, I, I'm always struck by El Corte Inglés being you know, one of the biggest um, um, shops in Spain. Um, and, uh, but I, um, and maybe we're known for bond and tailoring and things like that. I mean, who ever thought that Britain would be known for good food? But, um, and, and it is now, is the truth of the matter. Even Spaniards would accept that British food is now considerably better than it was 20 years ago. Yes, it is. British food. What is British food? This is probably not a very representative room, I suspect. But I mean, I just think it's madness, sheer madness. And um, and every day as it goes by, the process, as has been referred to by several colleagues here, just shows how illogical it is. I was in Peru oddly a few weeks ago, and. Um, God bless him. The poor chap who's just, the Tory MP who's just been made the trade envoy to Peru by Theresa May. And he was telling everybody, oh, we're going to have a, on the day that we leave the European Union, we'll have a new free trade agreement um, with Peru. And, they, and all the Peruvian politicians said, so what do you want out of it that you don't get out of the EU tra free trade deal? And they said, uh, oh, I don't know. Um, well, something about whiskey. And, they, and the Peruvians said immediately, well, actually, what we'd like is to say that anybody in the world can wait, make whiskey, and not just Scotland, but you've got protection under um, EU. And he said, oh, well, we don't want that then. Um, so I, I think it's all madness. And the Spaniards are right to think that we're mad. Um, I think we'll move on to another question, um, <laughs> which is uh, from... Peter Martin, um, Dr. Peter Martin, but I'm going to slightly broaden it a bit uh, so it doesn't come across as, as too sectorial or frivolous. But, um, it's given that immigration and the free movement of labour within the EU was the main issue concerning those voting in favour of Brexit, how do the panel see this impacting on what, as far as the man or woman in the street is concerned, is Spain's greatest export, the regular supply of outstanding football players? to the English Premier League. Uh, but obviously I wanted to those non-footy uh, members of the audience, I wanted obviously to extend that. Uh, so to bring it in, uh, uh, the whole issue of uh, academic uh, exchange, movement of skilled workers, um, securing scientific excellence and, and funding of scientific development. Um, so maybe I'd come back to you actually. Um, how do you see this problem? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think this is one of the key things because I think that the, this man and, and woman in the street don't really appreciate that much. They, they, they don't know exactly what this scientific excellence is doing for them and the, uh, the force that is driven by immigration. So I think that going outside the context of science, I think that the, the British government failed to, to kind of show the people what immigration can do for them daily. But from a scientific point of view, that goes beyond, because the main, main part of people that voted for Brexit probably they didn't even think about the impact that it, this could have in scientific knowledge, in development, in in the health system and, and and things like that. So, so yeah, I think I think that this is crucial in terms of uh, for us, like in, uh, for the for the scientists, and the fact that this is one of the um, of the key points that our members were worried about this exchange of skilled workers, whether we were going to be able to stay here in the same way that um, we could go to Germany and do our, our work. Um, from a scientific point of view, it's also complicated as well, because normally the contracts that are behind a, a, a scientist, or that support a scientist, are short. So maybe you move to a country for three years, and then you go to another country for another two years. 
and that is going to get complicated if you are not going to have your rights secure because you need to be here for five years to obtain a settled status or a permanent residency at least. So, so yeah, this is definitely one of the, of the key points for us. Uh, Fernando, you're being very um, jurisprudent and, and, mm. and, 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 and lawyerish early on, but I, I, you're obviously making the point that we're in uncharted territory, that um, <coughs> you really don't know uh, where we're going and all that. But, but on, on, on the key issues um, that are affecting you know, the thinking of, 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 no doubt, many of your clients, corporate clients, which is you know, how are you going to... Um, you know, what's it all going to mean for us in terms of the people we employ, uh, the, the, the kind of different divisions we have across Europe? Um, you know, how is all this going to come together? And, and what legislation in this country is going to have to... Uh, what sort of European legislation can this country honestly, out of this Alice in Wonderland that people seem to be occupying? It, it, is going to be able to ditch, you know, because we're part of a European uh, legal system. Um, I mean, what, what do you, I mean, you talked about being a, rather feeling like a doctor, but I mean, you know, if you're looking at this illness, um, mm. first of all, is it curable? But, uh, and, and where are the main uh, fault lines? The, the honest answer is that I don't know, of course. And uh, now after the honest answer, um, um, I would pretend that I have an answer. The, the, the uh, Obviously, the answer to the question depends on the type of Brexit the, 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 UK, the UK is pursuing. <coughs> Whatever the, the, the value you give to that statement, the, the truth is that the UK has recovered its sovereignty, whatever that means, right? And, and, and so it's, it's free is free to define its its role in, 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 in the world and how and how and how it's going to to fare. So in in, 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 in the long run the uh, the, um, the the English legal system will will adapt to the to that um, uh, set of intentions or, 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 or to that or to that political will. In in, in the short run what what I see belongs vaguely to the domain of, of the possible is that the, the, the UK to a large extent maintains the, um, the, 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 the actual legal scheme. So um, uh, the, the, while repealing the, the, the um, well it's, it's, it's already in place, right? The, the Great Repeal Act is actually, rather than a Great Repeal Act, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of endorsing. It's, it's a great, the Great Endorsement Act. You, you transform every single piece of legislation deriving from EU laws into purely British, purely British, purely uh, UK law, right? So I think, at least in the, in, 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 in the short term, the, the idea would, would or will be to, to keep things as stable as possible <coughs> because it's the only way we can deliver a certain degree of certainty. Taking into account that, of course, uh, it's not as easy as pretending nothing has changed because there's something that there's some things that many things that will change. But I think it's uh, the, the strategy seems to be that let's see, let, let's let's do things so that um, everyday life changes as little as possible. Jimmy, can I just, I, I disagree with that profoundly. Sure, Chris. Because I think there's a large number, if you, when I sit in the chamber of the House of Commons and watch the debate, there's a significant number of Conservative MPs who have a lust for chaos. Yeah. They want to throw everything up in the air and it to be utterly chaotic because there's a drama and an excitement and they want the moment of liberation or whatever to be, you know, one of the great moments in British history. And... And that's the battle that's going on, I think, within the Conservative Party at the moment. Yes. Um, Miles, taking it to the city, um, I mean, what's your... You're, you're talking to these, you know, bankers, fund, ra fund managers, you know. Um, they said they don't like it, but, I mean, are they having any influence on government? Um, well, the short answer is no, not really. Um, I think um, there's an element, obviously, there are 
people who rely on the European Union for their businesses are not going to be very happy if that situation changes. Um, I think uh, half, half, although there are prominent members of um, you know, the so-called business community in the UK who um, are quite enthusiastic about Brexit, um, although I think there is a growing realisation um, of the severity of the changes which might occur in London, especially as a financial centre. I think, um, I don't know if anyone in the audience saw Lloyd Blankfein, the um, uh, boss of Goldman Sachs, has recently uh, opened a Twitter account. And I think his third ever tweet was saying, hey guys, I'm in Frankfurt. Um, we're going to be spending a lot more time here. Um, and so I think he's clearly signaling to the world um, uh, you know, the intentions of, um, of that institution. So um, I think basically at this, at this stage, you know, there's just a sort of um, an, ex an acceptance. Um, I think you know, no, one, no, one is really, um, uh, no one is really thinking anything's going, going, going to change. Um, it's probably going to, because I want to move on to, I know that people busting to ask about, um, about issues of sovereignty as it affects uh, regions in Spain and, and, and the UK, and we've got lots of questions on that. But um, how will um, artists portray Brexit in years to come? Is it tragedy, melodrama, or farce? And if, if the panellists are feeling creative, how would the panellists capture the posterity, the spirit of these times? Um, Chris? Well, it'll be a version of Guernica, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I think in 100 years' time, the names, um, you know, John Redwood, Boris Johnson, and so on, will be on lists of traitors um, yes. on walls in, um, in I think I think they will have been seen to have done for their own personal <laughs> career advantage or for the, out of their own ideology in immense damage to uh, the prosperity of this country. So I think it will be a massive... It'll be, it'll be like the House of Bernardo Alba. It'll be <laughs> endlessly grim. Uh, John Carlin. No, I don't really have a view of that. Um, Miles? Um, well, I'd just like to make a point, which is basically, I'd probably say it's, it's like fast, but I'd imagine this audience is almost um, probably like 95% plus sort of, you know, Remain voters. I'm also a Remain voter, but um, I would say it's quite interesting in terms of the sort of farcical element of this, that we are, all of our discussions kind of ignore, we're kind of pretending that, there, you know, there were voters who voted for this thing. Yes. You know, there were people who, you know, they did put this... Um, put this question to the British people when they voted. Now, they may have voted in completely ill-informed and, you know, uh, sort of uh, imprecise, for imprecise reason, but they did vote that way. And I think one of the sort of element of farce is that um, what really was the Brexit vote? Was it a vote on the intricacies of European law and, you know, Britain's position as a trading country in the world? Or was it really just an opportunity to punch the sort of British establishment in the face? by large numbers of British people. It's almost if you asked, um, you know, Brexit is basically uh, a solution for everything. Like, my son doesn't have a council home, Brexit. You know, my taxes are too high, Brexit. You know, it rains all the time, Brexit. So basically, it's effectively a catch-all mechanism for a disgruntled population for various reasons. You know, standards of living in the country have been getting worse. You know, I think there's been a diminution in the way, you know, British standards of um, living in an international context, and people are upset. So I think there's a sort of farcical element to this, to see it as this rational process where everyone sat down, crunched the numbers, made an informed choice. I think it was just, if you'd asked a different question, it was basically, do you like the status quo, yes or no, rather than do you want to leave the European Union? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm really, thank you very much, Buzz. Um You're probably right, that, and I'm, I'm not going to take a vote on this, but you'll, you know, the, the sort of mood of, of the room, but I know that there, there are people who would disagree profoundly with what most of the panelists have been saying on this. Um, Nick Jefferson? Yeah, thank you. Um, but can you, can you ask a very precise question and keep it relevant to british spanish relations? <laughs> Why isn't there someone who supports Brexit on the power chip? Is the same person in the country? No, that's not a question, that's a comment. I, I think the challenge, if I may just come back on this gentleman's point, is that lots of us in this kind of circles that we move in are in danger of treating people who voted for Brexit as if they're idiots. Now, that's rubbish. No, no, hang on a minute, please. Rubbish. Can you have that a bit of order? Can you have a bit of order, please? Yeah. It's a very esteemed panel, John, but your piece on Barcelona was, was the best. Can you ask a question? Uh, the question is, 
Can I ask can I see those in Brexit? Because this isn't actually a debate. It's a, it's a series of people lining up to say how stupid those of us who voted for Brexit are. Well, look, I'm the person who has to face uh, the electorate most, and um, mm -hmm. and in my constituency, my constituency voted Brexit. Um, not enormously, um, but um, not like some Labour colleagues in the north, um, but, but certainly voted um, Brexit. And I voted against article, to triggering Article 50 um, in Parliament because, in the, as I said in the debate at the time, I can do no other. I'm sorry, I can only vote according to my conscience. I, uh, and, and I said in the debate, if that means I lose my seat in Parliament, I will lose my seat in Parliament and so be it. I hadn't quite expected that the election would be like four weeks later. <laughs> um, and I thought I was going to lose. I, but I was absolutely I'm convinced I was going to. One of the things that angers me is that, I, that the Labour Party, I don't think, put a convincing case in, in, at all in that debate. I was the only member of the Shadow Cabinet who said, look, Labour should be campaigning jointly with, um, uh, with Cameron because otherwise it's a referendum on Cameron. Um, and you know, Project Fear, the way that they advanced that cause, I think wasn't very helpful. Um, so I, I, I don't treat people with disdain who voted that way, but I do treat people who lied to people in this country in that campaign with disdain, I'm afraid. Can I just add one, one small point on that? Just um, since you raise it, Chris, um, you know, the sort of standard common view is that among those of us, forgive me, who think Brexit is a bad idea, um, is that David Cameron has got to, you know, join your list of traitors, you know, for having um, ordered the referendum in the first place. But I think one thing that is not given enough um, weight in this discussion is actually the complete um, failure to get involved, the absence without leave on this matter of Jeremy Corbyn. Because when David Cameron calls this referendum, he fairly reasonably assumes he's going to have half the Tory party and pretty much the totality of the Labour Party out there campaigning energetically in favour of staying in Europe. And as it turned out, the Labour Party, with you know, maybe two or three notable exceptions, was just absolutely AWOL. And it's starting with Jeremy Corbyn. And so, you know, I, I think that, that in fairness to the much maligned, deservedly or not, David Cameron, um, among those of us who are against Brexit, I think that um, there should be some sharing of that blame, and, and a significant part of it should be given to, to Jeremy Corbyn, too. Yeah. That's why I resigned from the Shadow Cabinet. OK, Chris, can we, can we just get back to the matter at hand? Um, uh, there are, as I said before, I'm conscious of time. There are various questions on the issue, obviously, of constitutional points. Um, uh, I think I'll probably take Hakova Roa Vicenza's uh, question first. Um, both Spain and UK are going through decisive moments from a constitutional point of view. Um, in the light of the British coverage and public opinion about the Catalan issue and certain comparisons with Scotland, I have come to realize that there is still much space for mutual understanding of our histories and political traditions from both sides. How does the panel think such mutual understanding can be improved in the current state of affairs? Um, Fernando. Um, you can talk personally. Yeah, uh, um, I was I'm think, thinking how, how to address the question. Uh, how, how the, the first, first by being aware of differences. I, mean, I, th I think the, 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 the way we can learn from each other is, is, um, uh, is basically from, from, from a deep study of, of our similarities and differences. I, mean, the, 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 in, I think the Chris's opening speech uh, uh, touched upon, upon similarities, but uh, you know, he, 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 he kind of missed certain differences which, which are not good or bad. It's, they're, they're simply, they're simply uh, facts. Maybe facts of whatever you want to name it. Uh, he, he, for instance, he, he said he was astonished at how how the king had to address the country a couple of weeks ago, and and, and he said quite rightly that he's it's, he cannot conceive you know, the, the, the the Queen of England uh, addressing the nation in the same in the same mood or in the same way. The truth is that there's been no reason 
in, in her long reign for the for the Queen of England to address that country uh, in, in a, to, to my knowledge in a situation like this um, at least to my knowledge I mean this 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 country has not gone through a constitutional crisis <coughs> like the one we are going through not not probably not in substantial terms maybe maybe, maybe they, for instance the Scottish problem is similar. What about Brexit and Scotland? Surely those are two compar comparable things. Brexit and Scotland, mm -hmm. yes, the, but, there's, but, there's, but, there's, but there's a huge, there's a huge difference between the two cases. The rule of law has prevailed in the Scottish case. I mean, irrespective of the political angle, right? The truth is that, to a good extent, due to the very particular arrangements in the constitution of this country, there was a referendum that was called. Uh, it was a lawful referendum, whether you liked or not. The uh, both referendums, this, 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 this Scotland referendum and the Brexit referendum. Whether you like or not, the outcome is another story, but the, uh, the, the UK constitutional arrangements were respected. So OK, Fernando, can, can I just move on to so a, a, a follow-up question, because you, you know which, um, you know, you, you might want to address this, but I, mm -hmm. I like other people's opinion around the uh, panel. It comes from... Uh, Jeffrey Cowley, uh, with imposition or the possible imposition of Article 155, uh, there is speculation that the Spanish government may take, take over or shut down some Catalan-speaking media outlets such as TV3. Is the Spanish government about to pre impose press censorship? If so, how does this square with Spain's international obligations to uphold free speech? Uh, John Carlin. <laughs> 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 Don't get me started. Um, Don't extend yourself too much, mate. No. Um, well, I was fired by El Pais two weeks ago because I because of my writing on on Catalonia, which um, uh, differed in some way from the standard line. Even though I'm actually as much or probably more anti-independence than anybody um, at El Pais, so you can draw conclusions from that. Certainly one of the sort of um, happy byproducts of my firing is that I find myself in the unusual position of being seen by fellow journalists around the world as a martyr in defense of press freedom, <laughs> democracy and justice. Um, on the question of TV3, I was um, on TV3, which is the Catalan public radio uh, television station on Saturday. Uh, they interviewed me for half an hour. And um, I was at pains to stress that I was against independence, and also I made a point right at the very beginning which I wasn't asked about, which I think is an important point to make, and in particular an important point to make to a Catalan audience, namely that it is actually very unfair, as perhaps has been part of the um, projection of Spain in the media, in, in the British media and other foreign media in which we projected or to present it as a kind of throwback to Franco, um, you know, dark ages country. And the point that I made on, on TV3, which is quite possibly on Sunday going to be taken over by you know, presenters from the Civil Guard or something, <laughs> um, is that Spain is actually a country that is admirably modern and progressive in many ways. For example, first of all, I suspect there's no better country in Western Europe for an immigrant, a, a, in particular a Muslim immigrant or for that matter, Romanian or, or Latin American. It's the only significant sized country in Western Europe that I'm aware of which has not seen, and I think it's extremely impressive, yeah. has not seen the emergence of an anti-immigrant, xenophobic mm -hmm. party in the style of UKIP, National Front, um, the, the, the Het Wilders crowd in Holland, etc. And I think that is mightily impressive. I also made the point that Spain is probably one of the, well, certainly one of the best countries in the world and freer, safest place in the world. And, including Western Europe, to be a homosexual. I think it's also a good place to be, and here I'm a more dangerous terrain, to be a woman, but certainly there's been a spectacular evolution in, in the, 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 the role that women are allowed to play in Spain compared to just 40 years ago. It's also, for, and this is more sort of fundamental, it's a great country, I think, to be a child or an old person too. And beyond that, I think Spanish people generally are, compared to most people in the world, are actually nice, kind, generous, noble people. And I think all these things are true. Um, and I thought it was important to make this point to a Catalan audience and to remind them that Spain is not only this um, mediocre, unimaginative, let's enforce the rule of law and forget about politics, Madrid establishment that's guiding 
um, the benighted and utterly counterproductive policy on Catalonia. Uh, thank you, John. Um, I've got a, a, a question here from uh, uh, Ruiz Quiroga, um, which I'd like Chris to address. What can Spain learn from the British experience in mending divisions in its society and culture in Northern Ireland? Well, we've not got a government in Northern Ireland, so I'm, I'm not sure that... I mean, I love the way Britain always thinks that it should tell everybody else how to do things. Um, it's one of our besetting sins. Um, and uh, interestingly, we've just had a debate in the Commons this afternoon about um, LGBT rights around the world. And if you look at former British colonies, um, they're the countries with all the really bad um, uh, laws and LGBT um, uh, history um, and... 95% of the countries, of the population of Commonwealth countries um, live in countries where homosexuality is still illegal. Um, you, you can't say that for the former um, Spanish colonies or the former French colonies. It's quite an interesting difference, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm always rather keen for Britain not to tell everybody else how to run the, their lives, if that's all right, Jimmy. Yeah. But, but the one thing I, I do think, though, about just in the question before, is that the that, that um, I remember when I worked for the BBC and I ran all the BBC and um, lobbying in Brussels, I, I never found RTVE very impressive as a as a news as an unbiased, impartial news broadcaster, um, and um, I, I think that's one of the things that um, Spain hasn't got right in the last few years is broadcasting. It, it seems to be fundamentally all biased, a bit like our newspapers. Um, I would, yeah, I would just, I, I mean, I, I think you've been slightly unfair on, on the Brits here, but um, I mean, as someone who covered the Northern Ireland peace process um, for, for the FT, I mean, I think there is a lesson there. And what, it, what is the lesson? The lesson is that, um, let us not forget, we had a, a, an unbelievably bloody uh, terrorist organization, um, not just on one side, but the other. Uh, we had a, a pretty tough military intervention at one point, direct rule, um, and, and there came a point uh, when uh, one Jonathan Powell, who was chief of cabinet of Tony Blair, uh, got um, both sides in a room. And I, I remember uh, Powell writes about this in his, in his memoirs, but he said, you know, that first moment when Martin McGuinness, uh, Sinn Féin, that everyone knew was head of the IRA, was head of the military council, um, Blair just goes straight up to him, looks him straight in the eye, and shakes his hand. Uh, and that completely um, wrong-footed McGuinness, but also put the entire process on, on, on a much lower uh, engaging keel. Uh, the other point is, is that the peace process and the Good Friday Agreement would not have been reached. And remember, it was a constitutional agreement, which was a compromise between the unionists on the one hand and the Republicans on the other, which no one could have possibly imagined even two years beforehand, um, was brought about thanks to the mediation of third parties, particularly uh, Clinton. Um, I can't imagine Trump doing that now. Um, but you know, the Americans played a big role, uh, and Brussels played a big role. Um, and uh, it worked. Uh, and I know things aren't quite hunky-dory now, but I mean, the fact is that people aren't kidding each other. Um, and um, you know the, the you know Northern Ireland is accepted by Republicans as as part of their existence. Um, Could I just add to that? You know Martin McGuinness shook hands with Tony Blair. He then shook hands with the Queen some years later, an IRA commander. Uh, Jerry Adams also became you know someone who was very much um, taken seriously as a political player. Uh, in Spain, the equivalent of Jerry Adams and Martin McGuinness, although that would be unfair because he didn't actually have any military role in the actual terrorist bloodshed, Arnaldo Tegui gets put in jail for seven years. And I think that little detail is actually very telling about Spain and offers you a little bit of a clue as to this rule of law at all cost business in Catalonia and not wiggle room for politics and compromise, which of course is a word which has no translation in Spanish, um, which is another important Let, thing let me just, uh, I want to end with two, two questions. Um, the final one will come back to Brexit, but uh, this is from Dr. Dominic Searle, uh, the General Chair in Office. Um, do, do, this, do the panelists think that events in Catalonia reflect the failure of Spain's political class to move into a post-transition era of democratic reform, which answers outstanding historical issues? 
for example, people bearing their civil war dead with dignity, and also to develop a modern democracy that engages with people in the way, say, David Cameron did with the Scottish people. Is the Madrid governing class, and I would add uh, the independistas, largely <coughs> in denial? Miles. Well, it's that, that's a very interesting question. I'd say, um, look, back to, um, I'd like to answer the question by slightly coming back to this thing of the rule of law, which is, um, you know, there is an element where, um, from an outside perspective, you know, I was sat in a newsroom in London, you know, when, um, you know, Fujimon gave his speech, and we were all sat around just looking at this guy in the Catalan parliament um, giving a speech, and at six o'clock, sort of sitting there being like, what's he going to say? You know, it seems like a big deal. Maybe something's going to happen. And it just struck me at that moment that, us and probably all these other people in newsrooms across the world, from like New York and LA and Tokyo, are watching this guy in the Catalan Parliament giving this speech, which is kind of remarkable if you think about it. And how he achieved that, he basically ran, from my perspective, completely ran rings around the government in Madrid from a PR perspective. So the sort of rule of law element always kind of ignores the fact that how is it possible that this guy, who basically no one in the world even knew who he was, suddenly gets everyone in every single newsroom in the world to sit down and listen to him basically go on about Catalan independence for an hour. It's kind of remarkable. And it's basically, it's achieved because the Spanish government, in, in, especially the Rajoy government, um, has a sort of remarkable ability to sort of snatch defeat, um, you know, out, out, um, from the jaws of victory. And, you know, in the end of where, is it really, from, again, from a kind of PR perspective, maybe I'm sort of overly concerned with this as, as a journalist, but it doesn't look good on CNN when you see, um, even if it's only 10 policemen bashing someone over the head, it just looks terrible. It's almost like the, the first thing, the, the images which the world see are not, okay, this is a nuanced debate about relations in Catalonia and, um, you know, with, with, with the rest of Spain and how, you know, Catalan autonomy might look or the rule of law and respect for the Spanish constitution. They just see people being bashed over the head on CNN. And that's what they see, and it's just these sort of own goals from a PR perspective that I think are completely unnecessary. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Can I your point on Gibraltar? No, that's not that's not going to definitely not. Juan Ray. Can I um, just going back to the to the Brexit point, I've got a question for the for the British uh, part of the panel. Uh, as a background, I come from I come from Alicante, which is an area where there is a lot of tourism, there is a lot of second residency. Um, you know, there is the public services and healthcare in particular are under a lot of pressure as a result of that. And I've lived here in this country for 18 years, and um, it's always baffled me that uh, no British politician or uh, British political party, for that matter, has made a positive case for immigration. So I think about the EU immigration, and to some of the points in the panel, the majority of that EU immigration is young skill uh, type of uh, individuals who have come to this country for many years and have contributed to the, to the you know, for the, from, from a tax perspective, from the public services perspective and so forth. However, throughout the whole debate, and for that matter for the last few years, I've never seen a single politician that has made that positive case to the population of why we as a country, or Britain as a country, are in a much better footing than we would have been otherwise. That sounds like a sort of challenge to me. Uh, the, um, the, uh, last year, you may recall, um, David Camp was he last year? David Cameron, was he around last year? I can't remember. I've got it all lost now in my head. But anyway, David Cameron attacked Jeremy Corbyn, saying, oh, you went and met, met a bunch of migrants in Calais, and now you, you're, you've changed your position. And I, I did a very short speech the next day in which I said, um, well, it's interesting bunch of migrants, isn't it? Because the Palace of Westminster was first built by King Canute, the Danish invader. Um, the second palace was built by William the Conqueror's son, the clue is in his title. Um, the um, Speaker of the House of Commons is descended from uh, Eastern European Jews. Uh, the Corbyns come from uh, Huguenot stock. Um, and, the lead, and, the lead, and the leader in the House of Lords, the Speaker in the House of Lords, is, from, is Portuguese of uh, extraction. So frankly, we're all a bunch of migrants. And interestingly, I didn't clip that. Somebody else clipped it and put it on Facebook, and it's had 13 million hits. So I, believe, I agree with you that I think that there are lots of people, both in this country and elsewhere, who want to hear that positive case um, for immigration. But I tell you, it's tough to make in a world of um, our, our press, of the British press. It is a tough argument to make to our British press. Um, and one of my anxieties about Brexit is... I don't know how the British NHS is going to survive 
and because you're far more likely to be treated by a migrant from elsewhere in the European Union than to be sitting next to one um, in the queue um, to see a doctor. Uh, all the new nurses that have come to my local hospital are Spanish nurses, um, and they're worrying about whether they're going to have to go back. So I, I, I accept that point. But the, there, there was a question earlier about Spain's history and how heavily it weighs on you know, debates. I'm conscious that the Socialist Party in Spain has a different attitude towards religion than the Socialist Party would in the UK, for instance, partly because of the Spanish Civil War. Um, but in the UK, I think that the, the thing that frames our identity is the Second World War still. And in particular, that moment when we were on our own against everybody else. France had fallen, you know, Belgium, Denmark, um, Poland, um, Norway, Finland, and so on. Everything had fallen, and it was just us. And I, that's, that's, I think, when it came to the Brexit referendum, that's what we were fighting against, that, that sense of actually Britain is better when we're just on our own. That was our finest hour. Yeah. Um, um, I, we're, we're, and I'm afraid I've got to go and catch the train to Wales. Thank, thank you very much. You, be, you better go to Paris. <laughs> I have, I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that's a for leaving. We are going to be winding up, but um, I'm just wondering if, if any other members of the panel wanted to address uh, one's question there. Um, I would just follow on from what Chris just said in terms of the, the role of the British press. I think there's been an interesting, uh, for many, many years, I think, sort of liberal-minded people, especially in sort of British metropolitan areas, <laughs> were sort of the idea that all of the sort of stuff in you know, certain parts of the British right-wing media were kind of annoying, but didn't really have much of an effect. So the idea of having stories about you know, the EU, uh, a kind of incessant din of stories about how bad the EU was, the things it was doing, controlling the shape of bananas, is you know, a famous example of a story about that, um, which wasn't true. And in regards to immigration, where there were basically constant stories about immigration, setting the debate for immigration, setting the sort of political space where immigration could be discussed. And I think the Brexit, um, uh, Brexit vote basically made people realize actually if you tell people certain things for a long enough period of time over and over again every day, every day, every day, eventually it just starts to, almost through sort of ambient noise, starts to shape people's, shape people's opinion and maybe distort them from the reality. I don't think when people vote, um, say, I don't like immigration in this country, they think of talented, you know, Spanish, um, you know, young people with PhDs coming to the UK to sort of contribute to the sort of knowledge economy here. I think they often think of sort of kind of cartoon figures of sort of like huddled masses sort of coming over and sort of bands and things like that, which is actually statistically a tiny, tiny, tiny um, thing. So I just think that, that that's what I'd say, is that the, the debate has very, almost like in drips, has basically been shaped over many, many years. Well, I mean, I think it's a very, very important point you raise, and I think you, you, you go to the heart of the failure of the, um, the Remain campaign. There was no positive message. I mean, I know that the newspapers are not very receptive to this sort of stuff, but you could have, you know, there was quite a lot of money spent on the campaign do <clears throat> just invest it all on two clever TV ads. Two clever TV ads, which you repeat, you know, as you were saying, you repeat stuff over and over and over, the 350 million on the one side, and you get, a, 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 say, an operating room, some British, very British looking person, you know, preferably an old person who's the sort of person more likely to vote for Brexit, and you wheel them in, and in the operating theatre, you've got 12 people, all of whom belong to the EU and these guys save their lives. You, know, you could have done something like that, sort of very emotive, call it cheap, call it tacky advertising. Well, that's the nature of show business, this is politics. And nothing like this was done at all, which, which is just, I find, extraordinary. I, I think there was, there was a campaign supporting these skilled workers and, and the immigration, but I don't think that it transmitted enough because the, I think, population, not only British, they don't appreciate that much, you know, the science. They don't know exactly what science is doing for is doing for them. And with discussions with my family in law, they voted because they wanted to carry on using hoovers that are powerful enough and you know that the legislation of the European Union was going to stop that from you know, like and it's like you're talking about a hoover and you know, I I can see this elephant in the room, you know, so many things that can be impacted. 
So yeah. I think that even, I, yeah, I, I think I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what the answer is to yours, what the campaign could have been. Um, but one of the things I would like to say, especially to that gentleman that was saying that there is not a member in the panel that supports Brexit, I don't really support Brexit. I don't uh, support Remain. Well, I do support Remain, but um, I'm not in, in one side or another. I couldn't vote. That's the first thing. Uh, you know, after living nine years here, I couldn't vote uh, for what my you know my future was going to be. And I think that um, I talk about numbers. You know, what I what, what I know from the society, from the people that I represent what the impact in their lives is going to be. All the scientific community is in agreement that Brexit is going to damage science in the UK. So what I would like to get out of this debate, because I'm here as well as a, you know, an ignorant person, is how do we move forward? How do we get out of this situation at the moment that all the academic community is is not understanding, and there is, there is not a, a clear path. So Brexit <laughs> has happened for many reasons. We can debate endlessly, but then what is the next step? What are we going to be doing? And then we need to use those numbers, those numbers, you know, what people care about to actually draw that path. Well, I mean, the, the answer to that, surely, and, and we're, we're coming to a close, is, is the reality. And the reality is that we're 18 months on from, from a Brexit vote, and, and people are still asking this question, um, which, you know, I'm, I'm sorry Chris had to catch his, um, his train, but, I mean, he, he, would, he would, I'm sure, confirm this just extraordinary sense, and I worked in the House of Commons, this extraordinary sense of, of, of politicians sort of, 18 months on down the line and getting the sense in Whitehall and beyond that there is no plan, you know, that, that um, and here we are, 18 months down the line from the vote, but also less than a year away from the, from the cut-off point, you know, and, and we're, we still haven't even got down to serious negotiations with the EU. And that's, that's really quite serious because if that, then it raises the question that we all, you know, we know, which is, you know, we, is the government simply going to walk out does it really mean it's going to walk out, or is it simply going to say, let's go back to the status quo ante? Because if it walk, walks out, it's not going to reach any deals any, anybody else in the world. That's the reality. And would you not agree, Miles? Well, I'd just like to say one, one, one thing, which I do agree with that, but I do think that um, I don't want to be sort of overly backward looking, but I think, you know, we've said um, the campaign was bad. You know, we said, like, why did this happen? But I do, I, I do think that the campaign was terrible. I think um, if you were to look at it from a purely kind of uh, a naked eye, just looking at the effectiveness of the Brexit campaign, Leave campaign for Remain, Leave was way better. Like, way, they ran it way better. Like, I don't know if anyone's read this as a kind of blog by Dominic Cummings, the guy who, like, ran the campaign. The, he, you know, it was a, with a huge level of cynicism. But, you know, he has an extremely long blog. I think it's on the Spectator website where he, he writes down every single thing they did, their entire strategy, how they use data science, what they were planning to do. He's basically thinking way ahead of these bunch of people who basically thought they'd just like slap each other on the back and all get a CBE at the end or something, which I think some of them actually did. Um, and he said, the 350, we had a baseball bat, I think is the word he uses. He said, we had a baseball bat, which we had smashing case of emergency, and it was immigration. And he smashed it, and he used that baseball bat. And he, made it, he may have used it in a completely sort of disingenuous way, but the, the Remain campaign was poor. But um, the, the other thing I'd like to say is that there are, we've talked about the role of um, the campaign, we've talked about politicians, but I do have to say as like a, you know, a British citizen who you know, lives here, who sort of watched the whole process, um, there are a lot of people I know now who suddenly love the European Union, who didn't love the European <laughs> Union before. There's a lot of people I've suddenly met who suddenly just, the, like, you know, the, the day after the Brexit vote were like, oh, actually the European Union is one of the best things in the whole world. And I didn't see them before campaigning, I didn't see many journalists writing, oh, why, 10 reasons why the EU is so great columns. I didn't really see any of that. And so I think that the, the fault also lies with ourselves. And that's what, that's what it is. Um, I, I, I hope we can end up on a up note and a positive note. Fernando, do you, would you share that? That, that you, you, you're talking to British clients and British people that you know uh, coming from Spain, would you say that there's a change of mood to, to say a year ago that people are beginning to uh, come back to Europe? Uh, regrettably, I think that 
from my point of view, I think the answer is, is no. I think, you know, all, all those doubts that are casted about whether there would be a Brexit at all, etc. Uh, I'm afraid it's, it's, most of it is, is wishful thinking in the continent. Is 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 that we are we and I mean we we on the other side of the channel are still quite in denial. I think that's our problem. I mean the the, the only reason why I can see a Brexit not happening is because because it's because it proves to be totally infeasible. Right? It's it, 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 and I don't think it will be the case. There would you, you will be arrived at certain form of Brexit, whichever it is. So, so you think that they will negotiate an agreement at the end? Well, yeah, of, of course. I mean, uh, the, this is the, the as to the negotiation itself. This, this, this is the normal dynamics of negotiation. Right? You, you, you don't strike an agreement until the last minute, until the eleventh hour. That's, that's the logic of negotiations. There will be an agreement, probably. What kind of agreement is another question. Right? Okay, can but I just end by by bringing it back to the soft? Uh, cultural. Um, I mean, last year was a celebration of the 400th anniversary of two universal cultural icons who I mentioned right at the beginning, um, Shakespeare and Cervantes. There is the issue of, of, of the dominance of languages. Um, you could argue, setting aside Mandarin, obviously, that the English and Spanish language are the leading languages in the world. Um, does the panel, those of you who want to comment on this, feel that um, you know, Brexit will, will not only damage the reputation of, of, of the UK as, as a kind of European leader that people want to listen to, but also have a, a, a negative impact on the spread of the English language. No, yeah. because the United States is the dominant power, yeah. and we are, yeah. but a small island, increasingly irrelevant. More English people than India. Yeah. Miles, Way more. No, India, I mean, just like, no, I mean, English is a language which is completely apart from the United Kingdom. I mean, English is a language. Mm -hmm. I just think there's actually no chance of that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the fortunes of the UK. I just think English, English is a global language, which is in many countries are far more, uh, uh, quite the, larger. The other two panelists in agreement with that? From an academic point of view, everything is in English, and it is, you know, on the Thanks. publications. And Thanks, so I, mean, I don't think it has going to be English has country. become the linguistic equivalent of the city of London. I mean, Something that happens to be related to the United Kingdom, but I, I, I don't think it's until people move to Frankfurt. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I, I don't I don't think that's going to happen to a large extent. I mean, there's this. It's it's simply because of because of, it's it's kind of a, an ecosystem. You, you you can't move easily. The same same happens to English on another land. It's it's it took off um, long ago, and it happens to be the. The language of the of the United States, uh, certain other backers. Um, you mentioned um, Shakespeare and Cervantes. Can I just very very briefly um, mention George Orwell? He had a, a famous line about Britain, which I think was, was true when he wrote it in the 1940s, and is certainly true today. But is also utterly applicable to Spain. If you recall what I was saying before about my words in Teve Tres about the difference between the society and the politics. George Orwell said that Britain was a family with the wrong people in control. <laughs> um, that's probably a good um, <laughs> final <laughs> sentence to end this, actually. Um, but I won't let you get away with it, because I want to quote from a, a, another British cultural icon, uh, which probably leaves you more depressed, but it's Charles Dickens and the Tale of Two Cities. And simply to paraphrase, it was the best of decisions, it was the worst of decisions. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, the hope of spring, the winter of despair. I hope that doesn't put too much gloom on you. Um, but look, I really want, I'm sure we'll all agree that, uh, and I take your point, but I think just to address, uh, Nicholas, and, and we respect each other, uh, valid point, but uh, what we were talking about here, although it probably didn't come across to that, uh, was not just a, a debate about Brexit. We were trying to talk about how it would impact on Spain and, and, the UK. And, and I think what we tried to do with this panel, which I, I hope most of you agree, was to bring different perspectives and different experiences to shed on a very complex and, and evidently raising more questions than answers. But I think let, let's applaud this fantastic panel, which has been really... <laughs>
drinks and, and tapitas, and, and any of you who are not members of the British Spanish Society, immediately sign up. <laughs>